There it is. That should be neutral. Well, I was driving a little aggressively in the Corvette. All of a sudden, I put it in park. It's stuck there. Reached under, shifted it to neutral. Thank goodness we're on campus here, close to the garage, so we can get it in there. We're going to have to diagnose and repair this C5 Corvette today and figure out why it won't shift. Welcome to Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com. Well, I got a little aggressive with our friend Harry's Corvette here. Threw it down in the low to go do a burnout, and well, it's stuck in low. That's all I got, no burnout. Brian, but I saved face, man. I slithered underneath, hit the transaxle back there with my hand, got it in neutral and pushed it in. No rollback, man, no rollback. Nicely done, he gets to keep his man card. You know, I'll tell you what, finally you rode in here in style in something for a change. I think I have an idea of a starting point on this C5. It's one of my favorites. There's some common failures, but talk through your symptoms again. You had no grinding, no lockup prior to that? No burnout, but okay. no grinding, no lockup, <laughs> no anything. I went to shift it, and a couple of symptoms is the, it's actually falling back and forth real easily. When I went underneath to shift it, very easy to shift as well. I mean, it's probably a cable issue, but there's always a visual inspections in order. Now, lifting, there's an art form to that as well. We always have the car up, poof, it's there. Not this time. We're going to go ahead and show you how to do it and how to do it right. The Corvette actually gives us some pucks right here. Now, lifting points, we'll look at that in a minute, but we can go ahead and install them there and talk a little bit as we're doing it, because if you go underneath here, these actually go right into the actual frame. You can feel the steel frame right under there and you can put it in. Once you got the lift puck in there, you're gonna center your lift right underneath of that. That's the easy part. You get the lift under there, make sure you're under some metal. I'm good. You're good? Yep. You'll make sure everybody's safe and clear. Doors closed, a lot of times I take the key out. Some of these cars will lock automatically. And then what I wanna do is I wanna lift it. Now the key is, I'm not gonna lift this thing eight foot and have it fall. We're gonna lift it about six inches off the ground. Right. And then what do we do? Give it a little shake. Yeah, Feels don't be really afraid to soft. shake it. That's really where you soft. want it. If anything's gonna go wrong, it's gonna go wrong here. So Great. not a problem, it's in good shape. But I mentioned earlier, the lift points. I'm gonna take a look at these lift points. You go ahead and get it up in the air. I'll get it up in the air, easy to do. Cool, now if you look at this graphic right here, this is pretty good because it actually shows the different lift points. This one here is actually for the Corvette itself, but if you're dealing with your car, look it up because you can see here, this is where the pucks actually go, right in the frame, we just screwed them in. But we have some optional jacking locations as well. The optional jacking locations are some kind of steel. Corvette's made out of fiberglass. You wanna go on the steel around here on the frame or you can see the suspension components, they're getting in on the suspension either way. That's what you wanna look at, that's what you wanna look for when you're lifting your vehicle. Just get under there, take your time, find some steel components, make sure you're on them. A lot of them will give you a jack location from the trunk. That's a good place to place the lift on it when you're doing it. Now, once it's up in the air, we're in good shape. We can go back and look at the puck location, and even more importantly, we need to see what's going on with the shifter. And thank goodness for a lift for this repair. Now, you can see the anchor points we were talking about, the pucks that John talked about right from Corvette Engineering. So we've got this totally safe, totally up in the air. And again, it's going to make this a lot easier. Now, our first step was to remove the central part of the exhaust system. 14, 16 bolts, something like that. A couple guys, a couple cordless guns. Two minutes, we had that off, down, and out of the way. Next, we had to remove the torque tube cover. Now, that was 36 bolts, 8 millimeter bolts. Not terribly hard, just a little bit time consuming. Two guys, two cordless guns, we made easy work of that. Now we've got access to see exactly what we need to. So there's the torque tube. Here is the shifter cable. Now, there's obvious damage to the shifter cable. I'm going to pop it off the anchor point here so you can see it. Take your time here. There's brake lines, there's transmission cooling lines. You don't want to damage anything. Get in behind the socket, the ball and socket right there, and pop it right off. And let me show you the failure. Now this is interesting. There it is. So it's interesting because on a C5, two common failures that happen in this process are the shift indicator, you know, the little orange arrow up top. That appears to be fine. But then there's a plastic linkage, what I'll show you, I'll show you that in a second at the back. That's a common failure. The shifter cables, not quite as much, but clearly this guy's getting replaced. So I'll work this down out of here and get myself back to the transmission itself. Now, there's a bracket that goes all the way up the side of the transmission with two 13 millimeter nuts. That top one, 
that's going to challenge you. But I've got that off, and now it's just a matter of getting that bottom bracket bolt out. Let me get up here where I can get a reach on it. And get on it better. There it is, it's off. Now that whole mounting bracket is loose, and we can bring it down, work our way gingerly down through here. Take your time here. And there is the entire shift linkage. Obviously, a vehicle like this makes so much power. There's so much fun waiting to happen. You can't get anywhere unless you've got this transition in place to get that power down to the road. So, we'll get this thing underway. John's going to show you how it all works. Stay with us on Tech Garage, brought to you by rockauto.com. Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com is brought to you by Borla, the world's most winning exhaust. Steel rubber products, quality crafted rubber parts and weather stripping. And by rockauto.com, all the parts your car will ever need. Welcome back to Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com. Brian, you made short work of that cable. Tell you what, that thing's definitely seen its last days, and I'm thinking you slammed it into low because that thing has a substantial bend. Yeah, we won't even go there, but let's actually show how it's supposed to work. I got a new cable right here, and here's the old cable. So what's going on after I did that, what you said I did at least, <laughs> it's going up and down. You can see that it's not actually moving on the backside at all. Nothing's going on because I can't get it through the sheathing here. Now the new one, here's how it's supposed to work. I'll go here, and I'll shift it. You can see the front uh, and the yeah, back fluid. beautiful you're actually moving it yeah. now when you took it off also Brian you took the bracket off man that was a smart move because it's so hard to get where it was located mm -hmm. just take the whole bracket off and this is good because now we can get a good look at the front of how you're gonna have to do it as well it's a matter of just popping this pin out right here so if I pop this pin out take that out and then even in the car you can get some pliers and squeeze it but because we're on the bench we're gonna make it real easy we're just gonna pop it off like that mm -hmm. there's a groove in there put it back in cable side down, lock, and then the old safety clip. That's the important part. Make sure it stays in there. Not gonna have any problems, man. I'm gonna be able to slam this one down, aren't I? Awesome, you certainly are. I'm getting to work. You get to work. Now let's look at the transmission and what's going on when we shift it. This is pretty cool because I got one blown apart right here to show you. This is actually the shift solenoid here and this is the manual shift valve. So if I reach under here and I shift this, you can see right there, I'm pulling that cable. Remember, the cable's hooked up right here and what we're doing is we're pulling it from inside and when we pull it, we're going through these different gears. Well, that doesn't mean much, but what we're doing is we're moving the actual shift valve here. Now look inside the valve body, I have that. You can see all these passages here. This is where the fluid's going. It's directing the fluid to go into different clutch packs. On the other side, you have all these worm passages. Now all these worm passages right here allow that fluid to be directed to one part or another of the transmission, either holding or releasing different clutch packs, giving you all these different gears. Believe you me, it's pretty complex. Check it out, I got it over here on the transmission. You can see this right here. These are the clutch packs. You actually have some bands holding devices. You have all the clutches right here as you start to go through. So when we shift it, once again, right here with the manual valve, fluid starts flowing. Where does the fluid flow? Well, right here you can see inside of here, there's different clutches. There are friction material and steel material. I got a couple right here, you can see them. And they sandwich together. So what's happening, that fluid's getting directed back here into a piston. When that piston engages, it actually pushes up on that and they're not allowed to spin anymore. They're gonna lock or unlock a driving member of the transmission. Well, what's a driving member of the transmission? Well, I got one right here. You can actually see the clutch packs inside. The clutch packs are free. Bam, I shifted into gear, fluid behind here, piston engages, and I'm locking either a sun gear or planetary gear set, spline right there, spinning around, driving the gears. First, second, third gear, whatever it takes. Speaking of shifting gears, let's check in with Brian. He's got the Corvette looking pretty good. The new cable, it's not all that complex. There's only five anchor points, the length of the cable. This job isn't about complexity, it's about access, so you've got to be patient here. Think about it all, the plastic connections, some silicone lubricant, which may help you get things seated. I'm going to start at the bottom of the shifter linkage, and then I'm, this is going to be the challenge right here, getting it seated back into that bracket. I'm going to go ahead and send this cable up and use the bushing to help hold it in place, like I've got an assistant, up above the brake line, roll it onto the ball, and snap it in. Now, up above, 
you got to get way up in here and seat it. I like to work from the front to the back on this. That's going to be your friend when you're seating that rear bracket. Okay, got access there. Now, I'm going to come back and do a final seating at that mounting, but it's anchored up front. Now, we come to the back. Now, back here, you can see the new linkage, and you can see the safety connector here, which is going to help hold that ball right in place. So once again, bracket upright, headed north, get the bushing in here to hold it, slide my shift linkage back. Remember, John left this thing in neutral, so we're going to be darn close when we seat it. And there it is. Now, slide my safety tab back, pull my lock hasp up, red tab back in, lock it down and we're set now one more adjustment right up here to this bracket this requires a little bit of patience I can feel it you gotta wrestle wrestle and snap it in place okay shift linkage is back in not that bad just take your time here we got to put the torque tube panel cover back on get the exhaust reinstalled get everything torqued down and set and i think it's possible that john's got plans for this car stay with us on tech garage brought to you by rock auto Welcome back to Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com. Now last week on Garage Ed, we talked about voltage. Quick review, that was pressure, electromotive force. We build our fat here with voltage. Now we're gonna talk about current and resistance. That's amp flow. What's going on is electrons are gonna run and I can show it to you in action. If I pull the plug, the electrons are gonna run through here and then it's gonna do something in the form of work. That's called resistance. We're gonna use this water wheel as resistance. That's like your fuel pump, wiper motors. Any component that runs has a resistance value and that's a load so watch as I pull the plug you can see the current it's running through the water wheel which is our resistance as it spins the water wheel it actually runs out as the voltage starts to run out that's Ohm's law voltage and currents proportional with resistance it goes down this is going to go up resistance goes up it goes down now to measure resistance you can look at this graphic right here you want to disconnect it from the circuit altogether and you want to use a voltmeter on our voltmeter i'm going to go to the little horseshoe here which is ohms of resistance now i got all these components at rockauto.com variable valve solenoid uh, engine coolant temperature sensor injector coil they all have a form of resistance and if i take my meter i got it hooked up in resistance I'm going to come over to my solenoid here and if I go across the two terminals what I'm actually measuring is the resistance value of the windings in there it's 7.8 now what does that mean well you'd have to look in your service manual to find out a specification <laughs> rock auto under literature you can even get the service manual so you can see what the spec's supposed to be if it's good or bad prior to doing some more diagnostics now amps look at this graphic amps we have to do a couple things we have to shunt the meter well what does that mean i'm going to come over and i'm going to switch it to amps down here and then i'm going to take the positive lead and i'm going to move it over to this side of the meter well, because we're going to take the electrons and we're going to run them through the actual meter here. So I switch it over to amps and then you can see I turn on our little board right here. I got this motor running. What I want to do is I want to disconnect the series, the circuit here that's going to it. And in series, I want to hook up this amp meter. So what's happening? Check it out. The motor's running. Well, those electrons are running through the meter here and it's counting them. Now there's two types of resistance. We can see right here, there's electrical resistance in our wires. They start to get high you got a problem you start to do bad wiring like that that's resistance that's electrical resistance you can see the wire right here not much is going to run through that that's not good but there's also mechanical resistance if I reach down here and I try to stop that motor it starts to make a higher amp draw now that's important when you start working on your car and you start getting components with mechanical resistance I can demonstrate it right here for you with this fuel pump now fuel pumps are a big amp draw if I hook it up I got my meter in series I hook it up it's actually running. The electrons are running through and we're looking at 6.24 amps. That's fine, but let me simulate. Now you don't want to do this at home. Don't go pinching your fuel line. But if I pinch this fuel line right here, you can watch that amp. Look at that. Things going up. I mean, it starts blinking on that meter. I don't want to go too high, but I can get that thing up to about 10 amps of 
amperage draw. What's that doing? Well, it's heating up that component. It's causing problems, maybe premature failure. You can see a fuel filter. This is a good fuel filter right here. And then if you got one that's clogged up, well, it's going to look like that. And that's going to cause a massive amp draw. That's a problem. So you guys don't want that. So make sure that you measure amps. Make sure that you make these tests on your car so you can keep your components lasting a long time. Now, Tom, he has all these components and he's over the table. We'll check in with him. But before we do that, Brian wouldn't let me live it down. He built this engine a couple seasons ago. And it still runs. Over at the table, we looked at a VVT, a variable valve timing solenoid. We looked at an ECT, an engine coolant temperature sensor, an injector, and a coil. Tom, whether it's an actual injector moving inside or it's just a coil with magnetic induction, parts don't last forever. That's not the case. I mean, and chains are only strong as its weakest link. So you guys offer units for a whole assembly, don't you? Right, right. You wouldn't change your, your uh, oil filter or not change your oil or vice versa. You, if you've dis done a lot of disassembling, replace everything at once that might, might fail. If, if, if one part is worn out, then the parts surrounding it might be worn out. Um, you brought the example of fuel filters. A lot of newer cars have a, a fuel pump and housing assembly that is in, in the gas tank and includes the fuel filter, the uh, fuel pump, and, and the sending unit for the gauge. If, if one of those parts is worn out, then another part may be worn out. And you're, so replace the whole thing at once versus having to take your gas tank off again. Um, and as you mentioned, the, the fuel strainer, if you don't clean that out to replace that, you're going to certainly damage the, the pump. And it applies to other systems too. Um, if you're replacing your brake rotors, you've got to get new pads. So we'll have a kit for you get your rotors and your pads together so you don't have to guess what you need. For your suspension, if you're replacing your struts, your mounting points might be rusted out or crumbling. Uh, your springs might need replacing. So get a, a complete assembly. It's faster to install and you, you don't have to do the job over again you know, a couple years down the road. Well, I'm sure glad you're here. Yeah, they're hearing it from you, not from me, because here we're all about doing the job right and doing it first time. We don't want to redo the job over and over again. That's pretty cool. But we'll be back with more Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com right after this break. You don't want to miss it. We're going to the video email question of the week. Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com is brought to you by Custom Auto Sound, the originator of classic car OEM fit radio since 1977. Mobile Environmental Solutions, the leading portable mobile paint booth. And by rockauto.com, all the parts your car will ever need. Welcome back to Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com. Now, one of our favorite segments is the video question of the week, and this one we can all relate to. Jump starting a vehicle when you have a dead battery. Check it out. Hey, John and Brian. I've been having to jump my car for the last month and my battery's relatively new and my alternator's new. Can you please help me out? Brandon, you gave us a clue in your description. You said your alternator was about a month old. So a logical starting point for you would be the battery. You gotta make sure it can receive and store all the energy that alternator's making. Absolutely, and Brian, our Firebird, it's five, six, four years old. It doesn't make any difference. Oh, a lot cool. of electrical load on these cars. They're not lasting forever anymore, so rockauto.com has a new battery. Let's go ahead and get it started. Heck yeah. Now, before you do that, you want to put in this memory saver. This is pretty cool. You put a little nine volt battery to it right here. You connect it. Put it in the cigarette lighter. It's going to backfeed electrical through the system. You have adaptive alarm, shift, stuff like that on newer cars. A good idea. Keep the radio station, seat memory, all that stuff. Now, you said, Brandon, you also looked at the battery. A visual inspection is not going to tell you a lot. So you want to use a tester like this auto gauge right here. Rock Auto actually supplies these as well. This is nice because it actually is going to do a load test on the battery, get into the plates. You'll actually see if the battery is going to be able to hold a charge or not hold a charge. Super simple to use. Just follow the prompts. Nothing to it. Another important thing, you want to keep the battery clean. You just get your battery tool. You don't want any voltage drop between the terminals. I have this cleaner right here. Go across the terminals. You can see it shine them up real nice. If you have top post, side post, you can use this or you can use it on the terminal as well, Brian. Dielectric gel, big boy stuff right here. Little thing means a whole lot. This keeps any kind of corrosion and contamination out, and certainly moisture, just another best practice. Yep, that's a nice battery. It's absorbed glass matte technology. I'm so glad Rock Auto's got these now. Yeah, you and me both. Now, when you're 
carrying the battery, you know, at home you may not have a strap on it or it may be an old battery. They also carry this battery carrier. This is nice because you're not out here trying to tote it or if you're rubbing it against your clothes. I can guarantee you once you get it to where you're going to go, if you take it to the recycle center, next time you wash your pants, you can have all these little holes on it for the muriatic acid and the acid in there that's actually doing the charge. So you want to make sure you get that and tote it right. Hold down, super important, the hold down. The battery has to be secure. Inside of there are plates. They're dissimilar metals. They're, uh, they're doing a chemical reaction and they're flaking off and eventually all that stuff's getting on the bottom. So if your battery's bumping around or slamming around on there, you're going to have a problem, man. It's going to start to short out the battery. That's hugely important. How's it coming over there, Brian? We're just about done. I'm going to tighten up that battery clamp. Also, really, really important. A lot of people overlook getting that clamp hold down tight. The battery's, battery's going to vibrate and fail earlier than it's designed to. Make sure you get that right. Well, today was a great day, Brian, that Corvette project, a little challenging, but we got the cable in nevertheless. Typical project, you know, access was the worst part. There is a proper procedure. We followed that. We got everything routed, everything anchored right where it belongs. I feel really good about the repair. But, you know, during the whole repair, John kept saying something about going to get donuts when we were done. Well, now you know what kind of donuts I was talking about. Man, I could have done that all day long, but unfortunately, we're out of time for today. So check in next week for more Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com. Production assistance for Tech Garage is provided by Shivala College, located in Mariana, Florida. Founded in 1947, Shivala was ranked recently as one of the top three community colleges in the United States.